You wake up in an unfamiliar place. The artificial lights overhead sear your eyes. Where are you? You try to stand only to realize that you're not wearing your own clothes. You're wearing a strange, humiliating joke of an outfit intended to make fun of you. You look around and can't help but notice that the environment around you seems strangely artificial. You're in a pretend forest. Plastic trees, astroturf underfoot, and beyond the trees, walls painted with fake foliage. What is this place? That's when another flash almost blinds you. You look up and see a large pane of glass, and behind it, gawking strangers snapping pictures of you with cameras, muttering to each other about your strangeness. You yell and scream for them to help you get out of there, but they just laugh. Nobody is going to help you. You've just become the latest exhibit in the human zoo. The term human zoo alone conjures up a horrifying image of people being confined to cramped cages or enclosures with barely enough space, treated as spectacles for paying patrons to come gawk at from behind the glass. Yet while this might sound like something that no moral or ethical person would allow to happen, there is nothing fictional about human zoos. These were a very real phenomenon, one not often widely talked about, given how much of a dark and unforgivable stain they were on the ledger of human history. This was no fun day out for the whole family despite being treated as such by the people at the time that these deplorable exhibits were in vogue. In reality, human zoos were a demonstrable and dehumanizing practice, born of colonialism, racism, religious self-aggrandizement, and simply abject cruelty toward other human beings. We're going to be taking a look at what human zoos actually were, where they started, and what they entailed as we try to determine what happened to them, and are there still human zoos in operation today? The term human zoo, as you can imagine, refers to any exploitative and unethical exhibition of human beings who are put on display as a means of providing entertainment. Don't get it twisted. This isn't to say that a concert, a talent show, or a stand-up night, or any other similar entertainment showcase qualifies as being a human zoo. We're talking specifically about public displays of people that are designed to make their audiences stare and laugh, while also intentionally demeaning the subjects of the human zoo. There's a long and uncomfortable history to delve into when it comes to human zoos. These attractions and exhibitions starring humans date back to as early as the 1800s, but there are examples of the practice that date back as recent as the 50s, only around 70 years ago. You're probably already familiar with the concept of a freak show, a common and equally unethical practice in circuses throughout history. These would see people who were very often visibly differently abled being put on display for the paying public to look at, laugh at and whose differences were ultimately exploited for the organizers to profit off of. These were in a lot of ways similar to human zoos. Just like the name suggests, human zoos were displays of people in a zoo-like setting. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the people involved are kept in cages, the same way you might expect a traditional zoo to house its animals. Rather, a lot of people exploited by human zoos were enclosed in different ways, trapped financially or socially, with some hoping to garner income in order to feed their families by providing entertainment. And of course, someone with the kind of moral and ethical fiber to run a human zoo would definitely make sure all their entertainers were paid fairly, we're sure. Spectacles like this, such as the one held in Tevura, Belgium in 1897, were often run by organizers who gathered entire troops of underpaid or sometimes entirely unpaid people and displayed them in exhibitions around the world. In the United States, groups of Congolese people were shown to the public, while Native Americans were put in the same positions in places like Brussels. These people, human beings, were kept behind fences or barriers, often half undressed or covered in animal skins, and made to perform degrading activities, all while the curators of those human zoos charged the public for the chance to see them, and then pocketed the profits for themselves. Some estimates state that around 1.5 billion people worldwide came to view spectacles like these, from smaller scale acts like the circus freak shows of the time to larger exhibits held at fairs or in some of the major capital cities around the world. And as if exploiting human beings in this way for money wasn't bad enough, the practice of human zoos also helped perpetuate beliefs in archaic theories relating to white superiority and upholding racist beliefs toward people being used in the zoos as exhibits. Also referred to as ethnological expositions, the unfortunate goal of these human zoos that have existed throughout history was to display people from different countries and cultures to an audience of Westerners. This was built on a foundation of the erroneous and deeply xenophobic idea that Western society and its culture were far superior to those living elsewhere in the world, who were wrongly and racistly regarded as being primitive or savage in some way. 
typically just used as a justification for othering and dehumanizing these people. The human zoo served to bolster this belief by providing a public spectacle for demeaning and dehumanizing those who lived outside of the Western world. So, where did all of this start? While well, tracing the exact origin of human zoos is tricky, since the use of human beings as objects of curiosity has existed as far back as colonialism itself has, let's start in the Western Hemisphere, specifically Mexico. Moctezuma, the ninth emperor of the Aztec Empire, who reigned from as early as 1502 to 1520, was said to have had a zoo a lot more like the regular kind, containing wild animals like bears, mountain lions, and various exotic birds. There's also some possibility that his zoo also showcased humans, since some Spanish writings at the time mention human involvement in maintaining Moctezuma's zoo. However, there's still a great deal of debate around this, that involvement could have just been used as tiger feed after a person had already died, of course. Moctezuma Zoo has long been rumored to have exhibited humans, particularly those with dwarfism, hunched backs, or albinism. However, there are conflicting historical accounts surrounding how these people were actually treated. A number of colonial writers, Europeans who traveled to the Americas or the New World as they called it, portrayed these differently abled people as possessions of Moctezuma. Other discussions surrounding the topic suggest that these people actually played honored roles in the Aztec Emperor's court, serving as confidants, spies, and entertainers. Whether or not Moctezuma Zoo contained a human exhibit is still up for debate. It's important to remember that early colonial writers' recounting of the New World would likely have been filtered through their own European-centric lens. Jumping forward in time to when global culture started making the shift from the Middle Ages toward modernity, and the Renaissance brought arguably the first documented instance of a human zoo, as we outlined earlier in this video. The House of Medici was not actually a physical house, but a wealthy banking family and political dynasty in Italy around the time of the Renaissance, funding the largest bank in all of Europe, the Medici Bank. What did they have to do with any of this? Well, it was the Medici who oversaw the development of a large menagerie at the Vatican. Yes, that Vatican. This was a collective of captive exotic animals that was on display, and the closest precursor to the modern zoo. Again, how is any of this relevant? Well, remember that we told you the House of Medici had a long political dynasty, and a lot of money. That brought them a heck of a lot of power, enough to get one of their own Hippolytus Medici a position as a cardinal in the Vatican. In the 16th century, Cardinal Medici was said to have had his very own collection of exotic animals, like the aforementioned menagerie as well as a collection of humans. Reportedly, the cardinal had a troop of people of different races, inhumanely referred to as his savages. Between them, the members of his troop spoke over 20 different languages and primarily consisted of people from Africa, Turkey, and India, as well as Tartars, a nomadic ethnic group mainly from west-central Russia, and Moors, members of the Muslim population of what is now Spain and Portugal. Elsewhere in Europe, we find an English explorer named William Dampier, this privateer, pirate, and naturalist had been one of the first Englishmen to explore parts of what is now Australia, and the first person to circumnavigate his way around the entire world three times. But Dampier's exploration might not have been so welcome to the indigenous peoples of the places he traveled to, since he was also said to have had something of a human zoo all of his own. While in Mindanao, the second largest island in the Philippines, he bought a native man from Miangas, an outlying island in Indonesia. This man, whose name was Jioli, was described as having been heavily tattooed. Throughout history, tattooed bodies have long been made objects of spectacle, both as a source of fascination and undue judgment. Many tattooed native peoples were captured by European explorers, then brought back on ships in order to be used as curiosities. Jioli was arguably one of the most famous examples of this. He was described by William Dampier as having traditional tattoos or having been painted over his chest between both his shoulders, on his back and his thighs, as well as sporting several traditional bracelets around his arms and legs. It's also worth pointing out that at the time, Dampier was especially broke. On his expeditions around the world, he'd intended to gather valuable spice and gold, but he had turned up empty-handed. So instead, he took Jioli back to England with him, intending to use the man as an exhibit, referring to him incorrectly as Prince Giolo, or the Painted Prince. Jolie was put on display at the Blue Boar's Head Inn on Fleet Street in London in 1692. Advertisements of the site told an embellished story of Jolie's life, describing, among other things, the supposed healing and protective powers of the man's tattoos. The paint itself is so durable that nothing can wash it off or deface the beauty of it. It is prepared from the juice of a certain herb or plant peculiar to that country, 
which they esteem infallible to preserve humane bodies from the deadly poison or hurt of any venomous creatures whatsoever. Sadly, despite the fictionalized assertions of William Dampier designed to drum up interest in his captive, Jolie's tattoos didn't have magical or medicinal properties. He contracted smallpox in 1693 and died, buried in an unmarked grave. In the first instance of something like this in English history, though a portion of his tattooed skin was removed and preserved, eventually used as an anatomical rarity at St. John's College, Oxford. Jolie's story is a tragic one. A man enslaved, forcibly taken from his home, and relocated to England only to be publicly exhibited for profit even after his death. And as if that wasn't bad enough, Dampier had also intended to exploit Gioli's mother in the same way too, all in order to earn himself more profit, and he would have done so had she not died at sea on the way back to England. Then over a hundred years later, P.T. Barnum enters the picture. Don't let Hugh Jackman's portrayal in The Great Showman fool you. Barnum was a ruthless and cruel businessman who profited from the exploitation of people used as exhibits. The only reason he's remembered by history is because his shows are considered to be the very first modern human exhibitions that were open to the public. Everything prior had all taken place behind closed doors, in the private collections of the very wealthy or greedy opportunistic explorers. Now Barnum was taking this exact kind of exploitation mainstream. Most notably among his human exhibits in the 1830s was Joyce Heath, an African-American woman who was displayed as part of Barnum's shows under the false claim that she was the 161-year-old nursing mammy of George Washington. A mammy was a term primarily used in the South, describing a black woman who cared for the children of a slave owner. P.T. Barnum also exhibited the pair of Thai-American conjoined twins Chang and Ang Bunker, whose fame popularized the term Siamese twins. Two decades later in the 1850s, a pair of microcephalic children from El Salvador were used in exhibits in the US and Europe. Microcephaly, normally presenting itself either at birth or during the first few years of a child's development, is a medical condition that prevents the child's head from properly developing. It can also have an effect on the brain's development too, and those with the disorder can be afflicted with poor motor function as well as difficulty with speech, differences in facial features, and even seizures. These two children were referred to as either Aztec children or Aztec Lilliputians. However, these examples were all merely the exploitative precursors to full-blown human zoos that were still to come. Sadly, the practice would only become more commonplace as it was more widely adopted in the midst of the 1870s. This was when showing off what were referred to as exotic populations went from something that was confined to a single exhibition at cruel freak shows to showcases in major cities across the world. Throughout Europe, in cities such as Paris, London, Milan, and Hamburg, and even in American cities including New York and Chicago, human zoos started cropping up in large numbers. One of the earliest proponents of this trend was a man named Karl Hagenbeck, a German merchant and animal trader. He received a suggestion from an artist named Heinrich Lutemann to hold an exhibit of the Sami people, a group from the region of Sápmi which encompasses parts of what is now Norway, Sweden, and Finland, as well as the Kola Peninsula in Russia. This region had long been referred to as Lapland in English terms which are still regarded as offensive to the Sami. But of course because of the terms used at the time, Ludemann's innovative idea for Hagenbeck was to host a Laplander exhibition. Hagenbeck though, not just content with already exploiting the Sami people that would be used in his exhibition, intended to go above and beyond for his paying customers. He wanted to sell patrons the feeling of having actually traveled to the Sami region, and used animals and plants from the area to recreate the natural environment of the Sami. It's a pretty safe bet that none of this was in any way accurate or authentic, but it is notable as being the very first human zoo in existence to go to these kinds of lengths to draw in an audience. After all, the exploitation of human beings had been going on for a while now. Hagenbeck's exhibit needed a unique selling point. It's Marketing 101. Shame that his latest business venture that he put so much effort into was human zoos as he would later go on to launch his very own Nubian exhibit and Inuit exhibit in 1876 and 1880 respectively. All of the exhibits that Hagenbeck hosted were met with huge popularity among the public, and the accompanying financial success meant that Hagenbeck could line his pockets on the backs of the people he exploited for his exhibitions. He didn't just help the growing trend at the time of hosting human zoos to continue, but Hagenbeck effectively actively encouraged them to get worse. The bar for this type of cruelty had been raised, and the public in the Western world had voted in favor of the trend with their wallets. 
human zoos were now being given a financial incentive to get bigger and more elaborate as a way to charge more. They began to lean heavily into racial stereotypes aimed at the real people being used within the exhibitions, promoting the ideas of Western superiority and feeding into popular imperialist sentiments of the time. The notion that what was being exhibited were the natural living conditions of the people and the cultures that were the targets of colonial subjugation was done partially for profit and partly to justify the narrative that these cultures somehow needed subjugation by colonial rule. Carl Hagenbeck wasn't the only one responsible for human zoos and their perpetuation of abject cruelty and harmful colonialist stereotypes. Geoffroy de saint hilaire was the director of Paris's Jardin d'Acclimatation, a park that played host to two ethnological expositions in 1877. Much like two of Hagenbeck's, these focused on presenting Nubian people, an ethnic group indigenous to what is now northern Sudan and southern Egypt, and Inuit people who are a group of indigenous people who traditionally inhabit the subarctic regions of North America. Thanks to these exhibits, the audience attending Jardin d'Acclimatation doubled to around 1 million people in 1877, and between then and 1912, there were nearly 30 similar human zoos housed there. The success of these Paris-based human zoos even led them to be incorporated into the Parisian World's Fair in both 1878 and 1889 with approximately 28 million visitors, the latter 1889 Parisian World's Fair hosted 400 indigenous people as their main attraction, complete with an imitation of their native villages, which was given a name we literally cannot repeat on YouTube. The reach of human zoos seemed to permeate across much of Europe, with Spain even getting in on the trend in 1886. In one exhibition, they displayed natives of the Philippines referring to them as the people that Spain had quote, civilized through their conquest and control over the Philippines since the 16th century. On somewhat of a positive note, this treatment of the Philippine people did contribute to the Philippine Revolution of 1896 when Filipino nationalists revolted against Spanish rule. However, before then, the business of conducting human zoos in Spain had even been institutionalized by the Queen Consort of Spain, Maria Cristina of Austria. A number of indigenous Igorot people, one of the ethnic groups hailing from the mountains of northern Luzon in the Philippines, were sent to Madrid and exhibited in human zoos. But human zoos weren't an exclusively European endeavor. Over in Chicago during the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition and Buffalo, New York at the Pan American Exposition in 1901 also featured the exploitation of peoples from other countries. The UK not one to be left out of colonial exploitation and far-flung ideas about supremacy wasn't exempt either. Around 80 people from Somalia were displayed in a so-called exotic setting at the 1895 African Exhibition held at the Crystal Palace. Even as the turn of the century arrived, the widespread interest in human zoos didn't seem to be diminishing all that much. That's right, horrifyingly, some of these zoos were still running even only a hundred years ago. France in particular continued to hold colonial exhibitions in Marseille in 1906 and 1922 and in Paris in 1907 and 1931. These involved displaying human beings in literal cages and often in various degrading states of undress. This was a pattern among a lot of human zoos, particularly the women who were being displayed and exploited became targets of this, being given a lack of privacy and respect and objectified while also being dehumanized. Some even had their bodies displayed or dissected after death without their consent. The 1900s saw a continuation of human zoos in the States as well, thanks to Madison Grant, a socialite, amateur anthropologist, and believer in eugenics, because of course he'd also be a eugenicist. At the time, Grant was the head of the New York Zoological Society, and in 1906 thought it'd be a good idea to display a Congolese pygmy named Ota Benga at the Bronx Zoo, alongside apes and other animals. The zoo's director, a man named William Hornaday, held Oda in a cage with chimpanzees, which is already hugely dangerous. Chimpanzees, especially those that have been bred in captivity, might seem all cuddly and friendly, but even domesticated chimps can turn aggressive if they feel threatened. And there are infamous examples of chimpanzees violently attacking and disfiguring humans. Luckily, despite the horrendous circumstances, Oda survived without incident. Also displayed alongside the 26-year-old man were an orangutan and a parrot. Appallingly, Ota was described as a missing link in evolution that deliberately played into shocking beliefs from the time, suggesting that people from Africa, like Ota, were evolutionarily closer to apes than Europeans were. And we hope we don't have to point out to anyone how disgustingly racist those ideas were. 
as this was the kind of treatment he received. Ota was subject to vigorous mocking from the crowds that flocked to visit him, despite a few protests against the way he was treated. Over 40,000 people a day came to see him. There were thankfully those that rightly recognized what was being done to Ota, and other victims of human zoos like him shouldn't have been permissible. Controversy started to surround the practice, and while there was painfully little in the way of audible objections, a number of black clergymen in the city specifically took offense to how Ota was being treated, being made to stay in a cage with monkeys for public amusement. Reverend James H. Gordon, who was the superintendent of Howard Orphan Asylum in Brooklyn, said, Our race, we think, is depressed enough without exhibiting one of us with the apes. We think we are worthy of being considered human beings with souls. Despite their protests, the mayor of New York at the time, George B. McClellan Jr. refused to meet with the Reverend Gordon or any of the other clergymen. That move delighted William Hornady, who thought that the objections by the clergymen would be a most amusing passage in the overall history of the Bronx Zoo. As its director, he was pretty apathetic toward how Ota Benga was being treated, unapologetically refusing to do anything about it, since their intention was just to put on another ethnological exhibition. He and his pal Madison Grant even published a racist tract wherein they asserted their belief that society shouldn't be dictated to by these black clergymen who were calling for Ota to be treated like a human being. Even after Hornady eventually shut the exhibition down, when Ota was found walking around the Bronx Zoo, he was accompanied by jeers and yelling from people. Opposition and objection to human zoos was far from becoming a widely held sentiment especially as many still continued to operate. In 1904, the St. Louis World's Fair saw over 1,100 Filipino people being put on display. The United States had just acquired a lot of new territory in the wake of the Spanish-American War, and this included the Philippines, along with Guam and Puerto Rico. The U.S.-appointed civil governor of the Philippines, William H. Taft, was the one who permitted the 1904 exhibition of Filipino people, which was held in association with the Summer Olympics that same year, in order to show off America's shiny new colony. These Filipino people were forced into mock villages, which were referred to incorrectly as Igorot villages. The Igorot are a tribe from the southern Sierra Madre and Carabao Mountains on the east side of Luzon. Even though they heralded from the Philippines, there was actually a variety of different tribes and ethnic groups of Filipino people being displayed in this exhibit, including the Moro and Visayan tribes alongside the Igorot. Yet, fair attendees either didn't care to differentiate or hadn't been taught to think otherwise and simply lumped all Filipino people in with the one tribe that they were aware of. This exhibition itself was intended to be a display of the power and expansion of the United States by keeping groups of Filipino people in a zoo in order to showcase their newly acquired territories. But in order to achieve this, it depicted Filipino people as racially inferior and incapable of national self-determination. These people were forced to perform their own tribal customs in full view of fair attendees, which were unfamiliar to Americans, and therefore depicted as being savage thanks to how these Filipinos were portrayed by this human zoo and others like it. These people were first treated as the physical evidence of the United States' power and as human beings second. They were only provided with minimal rations of rice, hardtack, or dense crackers made from flour, water, and salt, and a few canned goods when they were first transported to St. Louis. Many were sick upon arrival as well, then made to live in temporary quarters while the mock village was being made for them to inhabit when they became a part of the zoo. As if that wasn't bad enough, the exhibition at the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair inspired a copycat human zoo as well. A United States military officer, Truman Hunt, sought to start his very own exhibit of head-hunting igorots in Brooklyn. However, there were soon numerous reports of the Filipino, quote, performers being made to stay in highly questionable living conditions. Eventually, the federal government got involved and shut down Hunt's exhibition, discovering that he'd been guilty of wage theft. Still, there were plenty of human zoos being found in Europe too. 1908 saw the Scottish National Exhibition being opened by the grandson of Queen Victoria, Prince Arthur of Connaught. Here, one of the attractions was said to be a Senegal village, Senegal being a country on the Atlantic coast of Africa. Here, the Senegalese residents, who were fluent in French, were made to perform their way of life, all while living in huts that were designed for housing bees, not humans. The following year, the same infrastructure behind the Scottish National Exhibition was used to construct the Marine Gardens, a new entertainment complex at Portobello on the east coast of Edinburgh. Here, a group of men, women, and children from Somalia were shipped over to Scotland to be a part of yet another similar exhibition 
where they had to live in thatch-roofed huts. Further south in Manchester around 1925, the Bellevue Zoo had a display that was simply titled Cannibals. In an alarming and unconscionable act of racial stereotyping, it features black African people in traditional native dress depicting them in many of the same offensive, uncharitable, and dehumanizing ways you'd expect. And back over in Paris, the trend was far from dying out either. Around a hundred Kanak people indigenous to New Caledonia, which had become an overseas territory of France, were displayed in 1931, once again at the Jardin d'Acclimatagen. At this point, the Western world had been exploiting people from different countries and cultures and human zoos for decades, if not centuries. By the time the 1930s rolled around, exhibits like these were starting to disappear, thankfully, and some countries even discontinued ethnological expositions, including Germany. But sadly, this didn't necessarily lead to things getting better for the people who had been exploited by human zoos. As you might have already clocked, we did say the 1930s. And something else was going on in Germany around that part of history. Many of the people who'd been taken from their homeland and made to perform in these demeaning and dehumanizing exhibits effectively became trapped wherever they ended up. Some managed to make lives for themselves after they stopped working in the zoos, and even started families, and those who had been brought to Germany almost had no choice but to settle there. Despite having little to no rights, they couldn't participate in the same life that typical German citizens enjoyed. Then, as tides began to turn for the worse and the Nazi party began to rise to power, these former victims of human zoos were faced with harsh discrimination. A lot of the time, the only thing keeping these people out of Nazi concentration camps was simply because the purity-obsessed Hitler didn't view these foreign actors as a real threat. They were even forbidden from joining up in support of the Nazis, with adults of any background other than German being rejected from the army, and even children with foreign parents being barred from the Hitler Youth. This meant that a lot of these people were forced into munitions factories to support the war effort when the Second World War broke out, or worse, others were sent to foreign labor camps. Even post-war, it seemed that the world wasn't entirely past the obsession with human zoos. Far fewer of them popped up, and they mercifully weren't as in vogue as they'd been in Europe a century before in the 1850s. But there were still some that didn't quite catch on as to how vile and racist the practice was. In 1940, the Portuguese World Exhibition displayed members from a native tribe from the Bisagos Islands. Nearly a full two decades later, the Brussels World's Fair was still at it, putting a Congolese village on display to the public. That was in 1958. In the grand scheme of things, that's not that long ago from today. This human zoo was huge, too. On display were around 600 Congolese people, a total of 103 families of men, women, and children. A baby from one of those families named Yusta Bonaventure Langa died during the exhibition, he was only eight months old. In the modern day, you'd think it'd be more widely accepted just how horrible this practice was. Yet, even within the last 20 years, people have still tried to get away with holding exhibits that resemble human zoos. Germany's Augsburg Zoo hosted an African village in 2005. The organizers of this event defended it as being a showcase of African cultural performances and crafts, and was in no way racist since it didn't involve exhibiting African people in a debasing way as had been done in human zoos of the past. However, the event still received a significant amount of backlash. The issue was that presenting African culture in the context of a zoo contributed to stereotyping, which could encourage potential racial discrimination. Even to this day, many indigenous people who choose to live in isolation have been met with the same pervasive problems that human zoos created. Tourism has led to a number of indigenous peoples having their ways of life intruded upon, especially those who are known as uncontacted peoples, or indigenous groups that survive in voluntary isolation and do not maintain contact with the outside world. Yet, groups such as the Sentinelese, indigenous to North Sentinel Island in the Bay of Bengal, are threatened by interference from the world that classifies them as a vulnerable group even though they'd much rather live without cameras being poked into their business. Now, check out this last untouched tribe is extremely violent, North Sentinel Island, or watch this video instead.